I don't know whether I'm looking, you know, you're doing something new. Hey everybody, I'm Kelly. And I'm Patty. And we're here from Women in Reefing. And we are so excited to introduce the Women in Reefing featured videos. This is actually a Women in Reefing featured video and you can find the original on the Women in Reefing YouTube channel. The point to this extended version is so that us seahorse lovers can learn more about Deborah's experience with seahorses and more about her live feeds and etc. In case you haven't met Deborah, she's a hobbyist living in the UK that has succeeded with sea dragons for two and a half years. In fact, her system is so impressive that sea dragon collector Steve McLeod of Ocean Reef Aquaculture had this to say about Deborah in a recent Wine Wednesday. Deborah's one of the few that's taken on the challenge and, and met it head on. Her setup would be better than a lot of public aquarium setups. I mean, I don't know whether you've seen her filtration room and how much time and effort she's gone into designing and working out um, what the animals need. You know, she's got the, the best of the best, that's for sure, but she's put, put a lot of effort into it. Deborah has wanted to share her experience on Wine Wednesday, but she lives in the UK and that makes it almost impossible due to the time difference. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section and please enjoy hearing from Deborah. We thank you for coming and joining us and let's start at the beginning and tell us how you got started with saltwater aquariums. Well, for 17 years, I've been doing freshwater stuff. Started from the beginning, saltwater, once and seals. And luckily, the guy was pretty good. He went, he gave me like a 40 litre tank. Take that away with a piece of rock and stabilize it. A few months later, I got some snails. So he was really firm with me. After six months, I got like a couple of clownfish. I like, go away, try not to kill them. And then eventually I got off a, a pair of rectus. So I went straight to seahorses, quite focused. You know, erectus are my favorite. Did you jump right into breeding them? They were first thing, so they were early on. Um, okay. I tried a couple of times. I got like two through and kept them. Um, but then I bought some uh, reedy and with experience, even though reedy is supposed to be harder than erectus, experience is everything. I don't know. I bet even down underwood killed his first fry. Everybody oh, yeah. does. Everybody. And everyone like gets really upset. And uh, it's just it's a phase you go through. Right. So you were more successful with Reedy? Went into the Reedy. And then Reedy took over because they just, well, they were at it like rabbits. And there was just so many babies. And at first of all, I couldn't keep them alive, so that limited things. But then I did, and then literally I got up to about 12 tanks, and it got ridiculous. I had one guy, I sold him a pair, and they actually transferred eggs in the car, in the back. Did you use the Chrysler system, or how did you set up for pelagic fry? I had one tank that was a cube, um, but I had a lot of uh, air stones on the top, constantly vibrating. It was very rough on the top, and so it would flick them back out. So it would snap the surface tension. Um, I also had one of the big biobs. So that automatically gave you the yep. circuit flow. I never bought the proper stuff, the proper tanks <laughs> to keep them in circular motion. I know they make them, but um, I was getting so many through already. Tell us about your weaning process, or did you stick with live foods? BBS for the first month or so, uh, I'd start introducing fully grown brine. Um, by a couple of months, they'd be on a few live mice. But then we have river shrimp, which are a bit like your ghost shrimp. They're dead cheap here. You would have five reedy seahorses ripping a big one apart together jointly mm -hmm. and they get loads of nutrition and that uh, and they grow quite quite um, yeah i wasn't i wasn't big on transferring to frozen very quickly i sh i would have been if i was commercial i remember your reedy were popular what made you stop i i wouldn't be able to find the market one i couldn't I didn't have the time to hatch any more BBS. I had three big BBS tanks going constantly. Um, to get, 
to get a system going where I would have got more food for patch would just be horrific. I wouldn't have been able to sell them. I wouldn't have been able to look after them. So what I got, I've done makeshift and it sort of worked. I had to export to go any further. And then it's paperwork and faffing about, and that's not what you're in it for. Right. It's supposed to be your hobby. You're supposed to enjoy it, not spend your time doing admin and packing them. You have to go to maximum scale. I was selling for, I used to sell them in pairs, a couple hundred quid a pair, which sounds about fair. It would cost that. <laughs> it would literally cost that to bring them on because the equipment, the UV tubes, the amount of water changes you were doing. If you live by the ocean, all well and good, but I don't live by the ocean. Right. Um, the BBS, just just the eggs, the amount of stuff you go through, costs a lot. And then the live food. So I take mine to live food, up to say about four months, and then I wean them, and then I sell them either seven or fully grown at nine months because I found you sold them back from seven months onwards. They were a good size, transported well, and they tended not to kill them so quickly. So if you're, all that light food costs a fortune. <laughs> okay, so tell us about the tanks you currently have running. All my tanks are now cold water. So they're all um, 15, well, the pot bellies are 15. I'm trying to think what that is. It's about, it's about 60 Fahrenheit. Um, the pots have ended up, as things moved around, in what was the Dragon's quarantine tank. It's about 500 litres, um, sorry, about 100 gallons. Um, and it's because it was the Dragon's tank, it's got 100 watts of UV on it. It's, it's a bizarre tank, it's got, it's what would be normally a freshwater tank with some big canisters off of it. Um, just because I wanted it so that if anything ever happened to the dragon tank, the main big one, I could set up a big koi tub and steal those canisters and put it on that koi tub to yes. keep them just for a small while and then I have a a tiny cold water tank that is on standby just in case I need hot bellies canisters. Can you tell us a little bit more about why having standby canisters is important? It's so hard to stabilize that temperature compared to normal tropical marine. You can turn around and balance a normal marine tank probably in a week with the right bacteria and, and be reasonably confident and start with slowly graduate you can't at 16 C. It normally takes a couple of months for the bacteria to stabilise at that lower temperature. It just does. Um, it might be because the bottles of bacteria are commercially made for higher temperatures. So I do it, you know, I have very little experience, only, only sort of two, three years in cold water. But when I balance tanks, I balance them at 24 C. Uh, sort of the normal temperature. Fine in a week, dropped it down, and your nitrites just shoot up. The bacteria is like, oh no, and and then you literally you just gotta hold it. You gotta hold it for another month or so, and let it work its course. And there's just not commercial additives available because there's not the demand. So what made you even think about getting sea dragons as a hobbyist? I'd seen dragons, but I, I didn't think it was possible. I thought it was legal. I thought I thought they were, they'd be under sighted. I thought if any came out, then there must be some regulations. And so you know, I'd always I'd always loved to go and see them. It, we had some at Sea Life. Never got close. They hold them in massive plastic tubs that are dark. You can't. You just see light shadows and things. So I'd always wanted to go and see them. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, this uh, Eastern European company puts out this advert. Sea Dragons was saying, 2,000 pounds you can buy one. And I was like, this, this is fraud or something. So I, 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 I copied this advert and I put it out on Facebook. 
and everyone went, oh, it's illegal. No, 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 no. You can't do that. And then the rest of the people went, no, well, we need more than a thousand beetles. They'll die. They'll take your money. You'll never see it again. So I left it for a little bit, but it was in my head then. I thought, if there's a chance, I need to know cold water. So I bought some pot bellies. And I just started looking after them. And then I went on holiday one day, and uh, and I was in Spain, it was very, very young, and it was still bugging me. It was only a few weeks after getting the pot bellies, and I thought, I, I'm talking to the wrong people, clearly, because they're giving me answers I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear that. So I, I just Googled, you know, who's this person with a license? And it's a Steve McLeod. And so I was like, Google Steve McLeod. And uh, he gave me his Facebook thing. So I just went, friend, friend. And he said, yes, I like, Steve. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and probably like, he's so, and it's probably like a thousand people must do that to him. I don't know. But he was very good. For it. And he went, yes, it's possible. You've just got to have the right kit. And I said, right. Tell me what, what I need. And he says, you know, think four foot high would be okay. So it's about 2,000 meters. He says, they are sensitive. You know, it's, it's another level up above seahorses. Um, the UV is the most important. You've got to get like, you know, 400 or so watts on them, or they'll perish. Uh, and then I suppose he thought he'd never hear from me again. And I immediately rang up England, all the local fish stores. I went, by the time I'm back from holiday, I want quotes for four foot eye tanks. And then I sent him a few pictures, some room as it was coming on, etc. He told me he'd sent some to Dijon. And so I started watching. So my local fish store, Norton, gave me the passwords to get into the Dijon wholesale marine suppliers. So I could just not order anything, but just look at the numbers, drop it, see how much time I had to build this thing. Because everything takes months to arrive. It's like you go to like a thousand litres, and let's say 200 gallons, and everything's standard off the shelves. It's okay. And then you jump. It doesn't matter whether you're going for 500 gallons or a thousand gallons. Everything's three months to get to you. So it's taking me ages, but it's okay because there was like 17 sea dragons there. And then the number suddenly dropped to 12. It's like panic, panic, shove things together quick. Stop building a quarantine tank. I thought quarantine tank will save me because I can't stabilize. I can't, it's not finished, so I can't stabilize the big tank. So I built a 500 litre quarantine tank just in case those numbers dropped. And the number of sea get dragons are dropping. That'll be it for the year. I'll have to wait until the next year if I don't do it. So I built the quarantine tank, which is, you know, 500 litre tropical tank, stick it in the back of the car, get it there, put the canisters on. In one day, you sort of, there you go, start stabilising yourself. Um, I was still nowhere near putting water in the made big tank and the number dropped to four. Bye bye. And, uh, but I wanted a bit more time stabilising the quarantine tank so Dijon very nicely held them for another week or so just to give me a bit of extra time and then uh, and then I got a company to bring them over just got them a licence to import them because they were in the Netherlands so this British company went over uh, picked them up and then just drove very fast to the channel tunnel and then sang very fast to me. And then we got them there, put them in the quarantine tank and they're only little when they arrive, like 18 centimetres. That is so cool. So what was acclimation like? I knew the salinity and the temperature that Dijon was using. Uh, you never know the pH to the two open bag. So we've got uh, all the drips coming down from the tank ready, ready to do like a nice four hour climatization. Um, 
that would have worked with three of them, but one of them was very angry and wanted to come out. And they're not supposed to touch air. So they're packed in a bag with no air. So when you open it up, you're in problems because Mrs. B was just throwing her head out of the, town, out of the water. So I tried sleeping it and putting uh, the drip pipe through the hole, but she was having a bit of a fit. So I tested the pH and our, and our pHs were absolutely balanced. The temperature was balanced, so she went straight in. So did you have to add water from the bag to your tank to stop them from touching air? So there's no choice, you can't drain them. So what I did was, they were massive, massive boxes they came in. So I bought these, um, it was a five litre jug. So I would put the five litre jug in the box, in the water, and back the dragon into the jug. Sip it up, take it over, pour it in. So this, yeah, I cannot see a way you could not use their water. I mean, Dijon is a really good place. It's, um, and that, and, that water was from their tank that they'd been in for months. So if there was anything, and it was a species only tank. I mean, I did speak to Steve McLeod about possible treatments when they arrived. And it was, you know, they've been, they've been together. Okay, wait, so were you able to order directly from Dijon? So I had to use, um, a company in England, in Southampton, that specialise in importing, in importing fish and have licences. And so it was three-way thing, me, Dijon and Innovation Aquatics. We all looked at how they should be transported, which was the quickest route, was it a plane, was it a boat, was it whatever. Um, and yet you, a person off the street cannot walk in there, so you need someone to help. You can deal with Steve, direct but then you need a company at the airport so you need a freight handler to deal with it to go in sort out um the vet license the vat so you're paying tax as it enters the country you always need a middleman right. it's always doable without asking you to actually reveal anything was the pricing of getting them here ridiculous the price of fish is nothing compared to the price of the tank. right I tell Steve, he, he could double his, his fees because the, the price of the tank and the, and the price of the consumables. If, if you're on the coast, it's not so bad, but the price of live mice is, the price of salts, the price of replacing, I'm changing new V tubes every two months because it's a rack of sort of five massive eight, 85 watt tubes which have all got to be changed every year. So every two months, I'm changing one, moving it on. Some company might do it a few quid cheaper. Um, but saving a, a few hundred quid here and there on getting fish is nothing. And if I'd have known, I could have bought off Steve Direct at that point, I would have, but Heathrow freight handlers to me were an alien species at that point. It's only when you get to know these people so what was the first day like with them? Oh, I can't imagine. I sat and stared at them. Well, um, I built the room just under infrared uh, to calm them down for a few days because I'd heard a lot of horror stories about them freaking out quite badly in sudden light. So you can't really see much <laughs> so, when it's really dim. So I, I just let them set up. And Mrs. B, the one that freaked out, she was still unsettled the next day, so I kept it really, really dark. Then, the next week or so, I only used natural daylight, so I'd open the blinds just a little bit, so that it was gentle going up, gentle going down. Uh, noises, I constantly had just a little bit of music in the background, so there were no sudden, to cover up any sudden door noises or anything. Um, yeah, they were treated with kid gloves, I assumed they'd be dead the next day, mm. really. Uh, you know, you, when you went to bed, it was like, oh, God, what have I done? <laughs> but, uh, but they were fine. They were fine. And even Mrs. B, she was fine. You know, she just, she, they, they've gone a long way from Australia. It's a long flight into the Netherlands to then go back in a box to 
come here and they are very sensitive to start with. And you can train them with the light. So at first, once they've got used to normal LED lights on top of them, I'd start turning lights like lamps on and off. And and they put the notes on right. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot to the top, you do that anymore. <laughs> they warn you. But they gradually get used to it and then you do a slightly bigger light. And now they don't even look at me anymore if I turn the lights on. They're fine. That's why is it dangerous for them to shoot to the top? What uh, happens to them? It's their mouth, okay. then they won't eat. So they'll be, they'll be hovering in the water and then they'll shoot at one inch, put their noses up and look at you. <laughs> Only once I had to run over to the tank and put my hands in. Just, no, down, down. The next day I just started putting live mice in. And uh, yeah, they were fine, they just started feeding. Yeah, tell us more about feeding. How much do four sea dragons eat a day? Oh, I go through, I think, about eight. 200 mice a day. How much do you have to keep on hand to feed at that rate? At least a week's worth, sometimes up to three weeks worth, depending on where I've got them from. Um, I use two different suppliers. Um, one will go out that night for me, but I have to buy huge amounts from him. So I have one regular delivery every Wednesday of a week's worth. If it fails, well, it's something things yeah. do. Um, I have Steve Shrimp who will go out and catch the tide and dive that night. And then I have buckets of smelly mice everywhere. Like, you know, I have these big hundred litre buckets, white buckets, and they're just everywhere, <laughs> full of mice. So normally, um, I will have two days worth out of bags. So they'll arrive in little bags that all go into fridges. Um, and then I will always have two days out in glass, uh, glass tanks and they'll be fed. Because Steve goes out to the ocean, collects it every day or so, yeah. So they're fresh, totally fresh and fed. When mine, by the time they get to me, they might be out the water water for sort of three or four days and they'll be weaker, they'll be hungry and they won't be seeing the chishers. So I get them in the tanks and they have three meals a day. Of, um, I give them bioplankton, BBS, so constantly hatching BBS again to feed the mice this. But of course when they've just hatched, they've got the yolk sac attached, right. they're great. So then feed them to the dragons, they'll all be seen them. I have some pellets, which are slow vitamins, um, McKeff goes in, everything goes in. Right. <laughs> it's like, you're not quite sure, you know, different mice have different nutritional values. Right. You do, I've had no examination of British brackish mice. So I throw everything at them and they eat it up. And then I throw it, and once they're nice and solid and dark, I throw them in the dragon tank where they meet their maker. Do you ever worry that something might come in on the live feeds? The live feeds, the live mice, if they bring some bacteria in, the UV will stop it multiplying and getting out of control. It's not going to stop everything because the dragon's going to eat it. And if it's got it in it, all you can hope is that the dragons are healthy enough to cope with anything. They're not stressed, the water's absolutely immaculate and you've got that UV on it, it's all you can do. I, I mean, I, I have got the advantage that I can see the mice that are going in because I'm feeding them in tanks. And if it's a bad batch, if they're weak, if they're dying, they go down the drain. So there's no unhealthy mice going in. Um, that doesn't stop them carrying something, of course. Um, but there's disadvantages in any system. You know, Steve's feeding frozen mice from the Australian Ocean. They're saltwater mice, they're what they should be eating. All I can get is some random frozen freshwater mice. Yeah, it's not the same stuff. The, the best quality stuff in the UK is is rubbish. But R, it's by huge number of blocks of R, RS mice. This is quite a good one. 
um, there was another one coming in, but when I, I picked one on, oh, PE Mices, I think you're in America, PE, Canadian, I think, PE Mices. Well, I managed to go on to some of that, thinking I'd just, you know, offer it them, just see what they think. But it was dark brown. By the time it gets to me, they've shipped it over defrosted, right? So the quality of my frozen mices could also have bacterial issue. What kind of water changes are you doing to keep the tank so perfect? I set up an automatic water change. For about 2,600 litres, it only changes about 50 litres a day. Okay. That's all it needs. And I adjust the amount on the auto change to make sure nitrates keep below two parts per million. I just brought that up in my head that I, that was what I thought I should do. <laughs> I don't know. Right. There isn't a manual, right? It's just they're more sensitive than seahorses. I like to keep my seahorses about 10 parts per million. So I made up two for the yeah. sea dragons and I was changed to that. And it could well be that 10, 15 is absolutely fine. So how long did it take to get the big tank completely built? It took me about three or four months to build it and two to three months for me to be happy with it stabilised. So from start to finish, it was a six month ordeal of yeah. stress. <laughs> How often do you have to test to make sure everything's still perfect? There's probes in it at all times going to my phone. So it, it's supposed to alarm me. So if anything goes wrong and anything goes out of a range, my phone goes berserk. Um, everything else, uh, so I'll do a full test once a week normally with salvert tests, you know, from even from ammonia. I will still test for ammonia once a week just because it makes you feel better, all the way to calcium, magnesium, everything. Um, because again, I'm not using natural seawater, I'm making my own, and those salts are made for higher temperatures. And so some of the elements don't quite uh, dissolve as well as they should at 60 degrees. So I have to top up. I've been wanting to get an Apex. How have you liked using it? Has it made a huge difference? I alerted me once in the middle of the night. It went, it went berserk, my phone, and in pump on the skimmer had stopped. The skimmer had stopped, oxygen levels had gone down, and the pH dropped just slightly below. And I thought it's to alert me, I think about 8.2. You go below 8.23, so I keep it between 8.25 and 8.3, and it just tipped below, and it woke me up. Panic! <laughs> Run down to the sink room. <laughs> but of course, you know me, me, I've got like 8 million skimmers, so right. it's like piled a little, but of course, not a dragon skimmer. My, the, yeah, that's a big one. But I just put every skimmer I had in there. So I had like five skimmers all going where I sorted it out. It's five little ones for like normal tanks. And it did it, it was fine. It picked it up enough um, to bypass the problem. I mean, accidents do happen. On another instance, not long ago, um, the chiller went and the apex failed to alert me because I'd not done an update. But luckily I do a manual check of all the equipment once a day. So the chiller room gets checked, all the pumps get checked. So I just put my hand rubber gloves on, hands in, check all the pumps. Um, chiller was down. It's been down for about 16 hours. And it was touching on 20. It's gone from 16 to 20. Absolute panic. Uh, I always keep six to 800 litres water ready to change at the correct temperature. So I did a massive dump of water, changed the water, so that got it to about 90. Got all the stiff. Steve! The chiller's going to take an hour to get the replacement chiller on. How bad is it? He's like, it's fine, James. yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the ocean's 20 degrees. I didn't know that. <laughs> I was panicking. But the point was, the daily check picked it up, and because Steve had then told me, you're in no panic, I just dropped it slowly over the next three days back down to 16, because it needed to go down. That's where the bacteria, I mean, the bacteria, 
I had to go slowly as well because who knows how much bacteria growth have happened, therefore how much perhaps die back there might be. So thank God. I mean, I don't think I would have risked it if I had to have had to see somebody to, to say what is okay, what is not okay. Um, there's got to be someone at the beginning and then there's got to be a few like me and Lisa going, oh God, <laughs> try. And then eventually I suppose, it's like seahorses. Two decades ago, isn't it? A few people had a go, get some premises together, get a rough setup together that everyone else follows. But to have someone to phone has been an utter relief. Did you have to reinforce the floors to handle that heavy tank? That's the main reason why the tank ended up where it, it is. Because oh. I built that section of the house and I know there's over a metre of concrete underneath it. Because even nice. the 500 litre, uh, so the 100 gallon tank, sometimes start to bow them. And then, and then luckily, I've, I've got a few builders in, in the background, uh, my brother and I, so we just rip the floorboards up and then brick it up then to support it all. It is possible, but if you've got concrete there, that's where you build a big tank. Okay, first show us the abdominalis slash quarantine tank. Bruce. It's up yeah. we're next to it actually. Can you see can you see some pots? Where's my favourite? Oh she's up here. She's a nice one. So no, we can't be live rocks on a canisters because the bacteria's gotta be stable. Yep. And we can't have rocks in the dragons. I mean there's little decorative rocks, right? Right. That I would just throw out the window. You know, necessary, but there's no there's no live rock in the system. A full description of all of Deckard's tanks, including all of the equipment used, can be found in the description. All right, it's time. Oh, I'm so excited. Let's see the dragon tank. So that oh. is the dragon tank. That's the, the male. How can you tell male from female? It's quite flat on the base of the chest. Okay. Where if you look, if you look at toothless, it's quite curvy. Oh, Ruby's over there. There's not much light on them at the moment, so it's they're not looking their best. But here we go, there's Ruby. So she, she's got to put black stripes. Miss Ruby is the smallest sea dragon in the tank, but also the most agile. She loves playing with plants and doing flips, and has a special fondness for cats. And that's Mrs. B, she's the troublemaker. Still the troublemaker at the back. Mrs. B is 12 inches and the largest dragon in the tank. She's the one that's been a pain in the butt from the beginning to the end. But who doesn't love a strong woman who knows what she wants? So Mrs. B and Ruby will wake up later, but Toothless is always awake. The third sea dragon, Toothless, is one of the most laid back sea dragons you'll ever meet. She loves playing with the MP60s and playing in general. Just don't touch her plant. So the others sort of get, get up and get active about six o'clock, but Toothless, and, and often the bloke, he'll be up front. Sweet Pea is the only male dragon in the tank, but have no worries. He has the spunk and attitude to deal with all the lovely ladies. But then at, at night, we'll all come out and sort of group together and sort of swim together in a pack. Well, they, they twist and turn and they sort of, they, can, they like skin contact with each other. They tumble about. All the plants are plastic. Um, they come out. I did try one or two things like dragon's breath and such, but nothing much survives a good clean every couple of months. Yeah. And, um, and nothing grows at this temperature, right? That I can get hold of. So, so that's the tank. All the electrics are at the other side of the wall with its own circuit board with a sump room. So if anything goes off in the house, the tank continues, apart from a couple of bits. So on the side, 
Bears MP60s, big wave makers, massive ones. And they have battery backups on top of the kitchen cupboards, which you can't see. If the house cuts out, the Dragon Tank always continues. There's another pump that has electricity here on this side, which goes from, so it's a normal sump system, but it has to have internal flow as well. So it has an intake, there's a pipe there, goes under the tank, yeah? And then back up here. Just because it's, it's four foot deep and you've got to keep on moving the water. It is just glass there, right? And it's got a lid. It's basically just a viewing section of the tank. Everything else is in the next room. And the other side of that wall, I basically built a massive shed at the other side of that wall, right? Knocked enormous holes in the wall to get the water in here. But of course it has to have its own water, so it's got its own water supply, um, produces its own water, and it has an 800 litre vat there, just for water changes. The shed, of course, has to be thermally insulated, so then we put thermal insulation in it, plasticated it. Um, the plumbers I use at work, like we should normally fit bathrooms and everything, they sort of plumbed the water in from the kitchen into here, got me drains, which I need to take water away, and they've got six inch drill bits, so they, they drilled the holes, yeah, from this room to my kitchen to get the water out. These are the 85 watt tubes, so there's one pump pumping water from the sump into those all the time, uh, those are just the power packs. That is the apex. Um, that's the DOS system that is linked to the apex. So I can on my phone tell it how many litres of water to change. So you see the little red pipes? They take water out of the vat, as I say so, dump it in the sump, take water out of the sump and dump it in the waste, which is why I needed waste in here. I, I quite like that, although I didn't invent it, I stole it off of someone off of YouTube. I've seen it twice done on YouTube. A DOS system isn't meant to do us changes, and I thought that's cool. And I just played one episode, like, you know, first few minutes do that, <laughs> watch the next bit do that. Total, total steal. Um, yeah, I've got one set of pipes taking the TV system. We've got another one, it's the trickle tower. Um, there's again artificial H, uh, K1 media in there. Nice. Uh, what the pump pump taking it? So the bacteria is in that a big sand tower. So you've not got live rock, you've got lots of plastic and artificial things going on, and each one is on a different pump. So mm. if one pump failed momentarily, we'd be okay with the rest, and it's it's a lot of media as well, but hardly any waste. It's a big tank. There are two skimmers. That is quite a big skimmer. It's probably hard to tell how big that is. Um, and then it's a backup. Just now, so if that ever went, this one always ticking over, or if I take that one out to clean, yes. this one that's always there. Um, so there's a... Do you know, I've been in America, they're like little nano bio blocks, they're like nano particles, just artificial stuff laying about me. Well, they're also quite handy if I need to take them with me. Um, oh, these, when you see these about, these are battery backups for all the pumps. So, yeah, each, each one of these pumps, that's going to the, um, Oh, that one goes at Trickle Tower, this one's going, this one's the return. So they all go to controllers, which then link to the batteries, which then link to the power. So, and sort of every month or so, I just flick the electricity off just to make sure they all kick in. And they do the kick in really quickly. It works nicely. And then 
these other pumps which then take water out from the sump and push it through more holes to the next room. This is the chiller room. I'll put, I'll put my hand there, you better see roughly how big they are. They are big, real heavy chillers, uh, TK 6000s. So this is the main chiller and then this is the chiller for the vat. The chillers have battery backups, so I have to have a petrol generator, that green thing there, to run them on. So I think you need a fair amount of space. I don't think you can fill with a sump underneath it. You know, the sump room has got to be 16 degrees, really cold, and the chiller room is boiling hot. It's kicking heat out. In the summer here, that chiller room is well over 40 degrees. So you've got to separate tank, sump, and chillers. What's in the fourth room, the live feeds room? Every sort of test that you normally use. Life. <laughs> Lots of fridges. Fridges. Yeah, there's hardly any in there at the moment because it's cause it's Tuesday. There's two. Oh, I was looking a bit scruffy. So um, there's only tonight's feed in, and then I scrub them all down, ready for tomorrow's delivery. And what about the food for the food? How are you keeping the Artemia? Uh, I just use plastic. I use two plastic tubs. So one's just been cleaned, and it's about to have new eggs put in it and then one's going, so I just take these out, pumps out, shine the light on the side, give it five minutes, and all the BBS goes to that light. I have none of those fancy things, <laughs> because those work, and I have those. I don't know what all the fuss is about. They just <laughs> swim. Let me see if you can, can you see? They're starting to swim to the side already. You get a turkey baster and you suck them out and then you drain them through a drain. It's not that hard. It's, it's very simple because I sort of used to use three of those little tanks. Um, let me go back in. Running when I was doing the reading. And everyone looked at me strange for making BBS like that, but it worked. So I was trying not to spend more than I was making so I didn't buy all those proper upright fancy shaped ones. That's, I mean, if you can see them now, they're right at the side now, and all the shells are on the bottom. You just suck them out. Do you put your hands in the tank, or how in the world do you clean? Um, so in the sump room, I'll wear um, plastic gloves, disposable gloves all the time. For, so the socks taken out. A lot of live mice get in the socks, so the socks come out and I wash them out every day. So uh, I'll wear gloves then. Sometimes you're dealing with stuff and you've got, you're going to get your whole arm and shoulder wet. Mm -hmm. In which case I scrub down with uh, surgical iodine. So I always have uh, this stuff. I do disinfect. <laughs> Yeah, so I did worry about how much iodine was going to get was going in the tank because I scrubbed down with it so much. But I I test it every month or so, and it, there's not not in there because I do rinse off really well. But yeah, I would never put my hand in there without scrubbing down or a plastic glove on. How in the world do you keep your sand so ridiculously perfect? Four meter pole on flexi. You d you do have to make these things up. It's, uh, do you have to make Red Sea over there? Yeah, it's just bog standard Red Sea, live white sand. Threw it in. You could, I think if you were doing frozen food, it might make your life a lot easier if you didn't bother with the sand. Great. Um, but who knows? I'd love to see Elisa's tank to see what she's done with it. Because she, she hasn't shown me for ages what she's done. And yeah, but remember, I'm keeping my nitrates oh, below right. two point two parts per million. There's advantages of that, <laughs> right? Right. It's it's nicely balanced. It's there's art. It's basically clean water. I do polish the sides a little bit. The because um, it's three centimeters thick, the glass. But Flipper Max 
will stick on three centimetres thick glass. You do get a bit of look on the glass, never leave it, because when you're dealing with a tank that size, keeping it like that is fine. Getting it from a mess to like that, I don't think you'd ever do it. What else is special or custom about this tank? Uh, the base is actually five centimetres. Nice. Thick because they made it extra thick and they said to me, they said to me, just in case you drop something, Deb. If I crack, so if I drop a spanner and the first glass, so it's five different one centimetre sheets stuck on each other. So if you crack one, it doesn't matter. The tank will hold. Again, oh. the sides are made of three. Supposedly one can crack, two will hold. At uh, least temporarily to give you chance to get a, coi a thousand litre koi tub, get it set up, get them in, drain it, and then I would get ND Aquatics back. Um, well, basically to strip the glass down and start again. Wow. But it takes a month. It takes a month for the silicon to dry, you see. So it's not a, it's not a quick thing. If that glass cracks, I could, the sump can actually circulate in itself without needing the tank. It could stay balanced while we took the glass apart, rebuilt it and let it dry. I swear, when before they were arriving, all I did at night was think about how they were going to die. You know, <laughs> what was going to go wrong and how, it, how I could stop it going wrong. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know whether I'm lucky. I've only got four. You know, four's not a lot. You know, you're doing something new and they're real characters. I mean, and the detail on them. I mean, the intricate patterns on them are far more advanced wow. than any seahorse. They yes. really are beautiful. And, and at night when they glow, they really are lovely. Yeah, they have, um, the, 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 the leaves sort of glow a bit white. Um, and the yellow, where the fins come out there. You can see how bright that is. So what did you end up with for lighting on the tank? So I've got them to, to the point where I can turn the kitchen lights on. Let's not get overexcited. <laughs> you could not turn the kitchen lights on when they went in at all. They would have gone berserk. When they first went in there, all they had was some very weak LEDs. Um, but they were so weak, but at night, you see, the shock of turning the kitchen lights on would have really frightened them. So you can't do it until you train them with little lamps and get them used to on-off situations. But uh, now, now they're fine, but they're still not strong lights. So I'll show you what I've got. I've got one of the lids off. So there's the night light that's on all the time. So, which is just blue, so it's not looking blue. It's, it's now prime. And then in for the day, there's just big strips of LEDs. Nothing special at all. With only one male, do you see any courting behavior? So the male, so there's two females that seem to court very steadily with that male. And then three sort of stick around together. And then there's Ruby her there. And she doesn't look about with the male. And she oh. tends to swim. It's really sad. She tends to swim on her own more. Well, I did think about getting her another bloke, but it's not as easily said as done because to try and quarantine one all on its own to bring it in would be hard. So I'd probably have to bring two in. And then to transport them nicely, you they don't do well when they're older. They've got to be quite young. But you can't sex them when they're young. And they could both end up female. Oh, they're mirroring. There you go. Deborah explained that mirroring is an intricate part of sea dragon courtship in which they literally mimic each other's movements and curl their bodies and tails into the exact same position so that looking at their partner feels like looking in the mirror in hopes of convincing the partner to gracefully swim towards the surface where an egg exchange can occur.
but they both have to want to. They do it all the time. And that is with Ruby, actually. So they're not monogamous or anything like that? No. Then? Yeah. Have you ever had him get eggs? Not yet, then. They're about three years old. So they're about the right time, but who knows? I don't mess around with temperatures or lighting to simulate a year. I haven't got the ocean. I haven't got baby mice. If it happens, I will go for it and attempt to bring them on with brine shrimp so they get big enough to have mice in, adult mice. But um, mice, if I did it, a lot would die. Those without a doubt, because you know, Steve can go into the ocean and pull out thousands of baby mice where I can't. I'll give it a damn good go. Are you able to keep cleanup crew in the tank, or are you the cleanup crew? I think I killed about 20 snails trying to get them down to 16 degrees. But it gets to, I'm sure if I got the right species and the right way about it, perhaps I could, but you get to the point where I'm coping without them. So the mice is everything, really. A few of these river shrimp gets in. I don't know if you can see them. They're a funny shrimp at the back, river shrimp, a bit like your ghost shrimp. Yep. So a few come in by accident on the live food. Um, and they're a bit of a cleanup crew, but I don't like them. So they, so I set a trap to get those out most weeks. They're frightened to death. <laughs> so they only clean the edge of the tank because they're hiding in the corner because they think the dragons are going to eat them. And so will they? Bit... No, no. Dragons don't eat anything but mice. What are the top three things that you attribute your success with sea dragons to? The temperature's low. There's, there's very little dissolved in organics and there's very little light as well yeah. compared to, you know, thing like that, a proper, so that's a Red Sea reefer, you know, great big lights on top. So that gets manky all the time. I'm constantly scraping it and it's water quality is rubbish. But the lights are a big thing. The general average person coming in this house ignores that tank and goes straight over to them and goes, oh, aren't they nice and orange? Because the normal tropical, you know, they'll yeah. come straight up to you at the glass, won't they? Oh, feed me, feed me, feed me. <laughs> You've got to be a seahorse person to like appreciate that tank, I think. And the sea dragons themselves actually appreciate the other tanks and animals, right? They do look outside the tank. When they first came in this room, mm -hmm. they were looking at the tropical tank. They must have been thinking, what are those fat ugly things over there? And then, uh, and then they saw the first cat because they were previously in my study, kept away from everything. So, and I don't suppose Steve or De Jong, you know, because they're in a species only tank, they've probably never seen normal fish or animals, but they're not frightened of them. What is the biggest piece of advice you would give someone that did want to set up on four sea dragons? Don't try and cut corners. Every, you know, when people have gone, you've done what? You've bought a second chiller. You know, that's £4,000 down the drain. Well, strangely, no, it wasn't. Because the chip, it's equipment, it goes. And what are you going to do? You know, spend thousands and thousands and thousands on this thing and then let them die in the first chaos. We're not. That's the biggest difference between an individual and a national aquarium is that they've got loads of 2,000 litre tanks all over the place. Yeah. When something goes horrifically, horrifically wrong, they've got a million pumps, they've got a million tanks. So you have got to spend the extra, get the pumps, that can be battery backed up, get your petrol generator, you're on your own, you know, you're not going to be able to save these any other way, but apart from yourself. So for everything you buy, you've got to have a spare one. And is your advice different for any new woman in reefing? I think start slowly. Um, I took a long time going from freshwater to marine 
and none of that helped. No experience with fresh water helps you in marine. And I just close my eyes when I see people going into marine and going straight to seahorses. Um, whether it's sea or sea jack, you've got to build up. I mean, I think I made, it was a bit risky going from pot bellies. That was my attempt at trying to desperately grasp some experience at cold water with the pot bellies. But I had very little experience of the plumbing involved. Yeah. In you know, just go and so yeah, you've got a fair old life, just keep on plugging away at it year after year and anything worthwhile, you're not gonna get too rushed. There was no way I could have made this tang in less than six months and got it right. Because every set after what each piece of gluing, you know, every bit had to be tested, everything had to be washed down so many times. Um I mean, I think the route I went, just working with a tank and a cleanup crew for a good six months before you even get a fish, is worthwhile. I actually took, got her to send me some photos of her tank the other day because I'm trying to convince my partner that we need a tank at home. Um, and I think Deborah's is a very, very good example of um, what can be achieved. Check the description to find a full listing of all of the equipment used in each of Deborah's tanks. And be sure to check out the Women in Reefing channel where we feature a different woman every week sharing their successes in the hobby and industry. Make sure you're subscribed to all of the Women in Reefing channels so that you never miss a feature video or any other cool plants we're going to be rolling out pretty soon.